If we've not met, I'm Tom Collins. I'm the Neubauer Family Executive Director and President here at the Barnes Foundation. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to our artist's lecture and conversation with Mark Thomas Gibson. I want to extend a special greeting to our friends from Miami, our special guests from Swarthmore College, and to those many of you who are tuning in online. This evening's program is a collaboration with Miami MOCAD, a virtual museum devoted to the contemporary art of the African diaspora. You will hear more about Miami MOCAD in just a moment, but for now, let me say, this institution has made, in a very short time, remarkable strides using technology to facilitate dialogues about the contemporary black experience and to bring the work of talented artists like Mark to audiences around the world. The Barnes, too, has a serious commitment to celebrating black art and culture that dates all the way back to our founding in 1922. And because we have also embraced technology as a way of democratizing access to art and education, our online classes, for example, enroll students from all 50 states and around the world. We are particularly enthusiastic about this ongoing partnership. Tonight's talk uh, will be presented using the Barnes State of the Art Art Distance Learning Platform that was designed specifically for the study of visual materials. And as you'll see momentarily, the technology lets the speaker zoom in on a work of art down to the tiniest detail. And when it's used to its full potential in a class, students can also activate that feature and explore visual materials on their own. If you are interested in learning more about this platform, which we call the Visual Experience Platform, or VXP, and I should mention that this is a proprietary platform we developed here at the Barnes, you should feel free to reach out to us, specifically to Dr. Martha Lucy, who is the Barnes Deputy Director for Research, Interpretation, and Education, and Martha's contact information is on our website at barnesfoundation.org. But now, let me introduce to me a very special person. I consider her a hero, a dear friend, and a bit of a guru, Marilyn Hollifield. Marilyn is the co-founder and board chair of Miami MOCAD, and it is a delight, Marilyn, to have you here at the Barnes Foundation. Would you come up and say a few words? Thank you, Tom, for those kind words. This evening is a splendid convergence of art, technology, and collaboration. My deep thanks to Tom Collins for being a supporter of Miami MOCAD from the very first day I mentioned this improbable idea of a new museum in Miami that would leverage technology to showcase art of the African diaspora. Thanks to Tom and his team, Miami MOCAD is here at the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia. And the Barnes Foundation is in Miami at the Miami MOCAD watch party, in person and online. Here is a big shout out to all of Miami MOCAD's viewers at the watch party, in person and online and a huge thanks to the Miami MOCAD team for making this event a success. Thank you. Tom has also been a strong supporter of the Swarthmore Black Alumni Network, also known as SBAN. The collaboration this evening brought SBAN to the Barnes Foundation and to the Miami MOCAD Watch Party. Thanks, Tom, Swarthmore College, D. Butler Sims of the Alumni Office, and co-chairs of SBAN, Nikki Oldham and Tim Harrison, for this wonderful co collaboration. Little did I know that when I visited the studio of Mark Thomas Gibson here in Philadelphia, that Mark would end up participating in Miami MOCAD's first virtual exhibition, This Life, Black Life in the Time of Now, which will be released 
as augmented and virtual reality apps in Apple and Google app stores. Thank you, Mark, for graciously taking me to your studio and bringing your art and thoughtful insights to Miami MOCAD's exhibition and companion documentary. Again, I am totally thrilled that the Swarthmore Black Alumni Network and the Miami Museum of Contemporary Art of the African Diaspora are at the Barnes Foundation, and that the Barnes Foundation and SBAN are at the Miami MOCAD Watch Party. Thank you. Enjoy the evening. And I promise I'm the last person before uh, the main event. Um, my name is Martha Lucy. I'm Deputy Director for Research, Interpretation, and Education. Uh, Marilyn, it has been a, a delight to partner with you and your team. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Mark Thomas Gibson. Mark is uh, a Miami native, um, but now lives in Philadelphia. So it's another um, kind of, uh, you know, reason for, for this, this partnership. Um, he received his BA from Cooper Union and his MFA from Yale. He now lives in Philly, uh, where he is professor of painting at Temple's Tyler School of Art. As an artist, Mark's primary media are drawings, paintings, and books. Um, I had also had the opportunity to visit his studio with James, um, and it was, it was wonderful. Um, and I've been learning about his work. Um, I, think it's an, I think it's really incredible. He infuses his work with pop culture references. Um, he uses caricature and sometimes text to deliver scathing commentary on American history and on our current uh, dystopian media landscape. It is powerful work, not only visually compelling, but also bracingly unabashedly political. Mark has released two books. The first, titled Some Monsters Loom Large, came out in 2016. A year later, he published Early Retirement, which was acquired by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He has had, um, I don't, at least eight solo exhibitions, the most recent of which was at the Sakama Jenkins Gallery in Manhattan in 2023. He has been awarded many prestigious fellowships from institutions like the Guggenheim Foundation, the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage, and Princeton University's Lewis Center for the Arts. So um, what we're going to do is Mark is going to speak about his work, and then he will be joined on stage by my colleague, James Claiborne. James is our wonderful deputy director for community engagement. Um, and just a little about James. In this role, he focuses on building relationships with arts and culture partners in the city and beyond. He has curated some incredible projects over the past couple of years here at the Barnes, including um, a project uh, by John Dowell and um, an installation piece with Brandon Fernandez. And he was also co-curator of our 2023 exhibition, William Edmondson. Um, before I invite Mark up to the stage, I want to just thank my colleagues here at the Barnes, Aaliyah Palumbo, um, for all her work organizing this program. Um, Kim Jakominich in marketing, who did um, a wonderful job getting the word out. Um, and of course, our AV team, um, who is uh, just the best. So um, with that, please welcome Mark Thomas Gibson. Yeah. Hi. Hi, good evening. Um, just want to double check this uh, sound. It's a little striking because I'm also mic'd at the same time. So hi, good evening everyone. My name is Mark Thomas Gibson. Um, very happy to be here tonight. Uh, it's a real honor. Hey, you. Uh, <laughs> it's a real honor to be here with all of you. I just would like to say thank you to the Barnes for allowing this talk to occur and to give me this opportunity and this platform to talk about my work and what I've been doing over the last six years here in Philadelphia. And I also want to say thank you to Marilyn. Um, it means so much 
that you've been able to um, give me this kind of care, love and support over the last year. And I want you to understand it, it means so much to actually feel like I'm being seen by another individual. So thank you for that. Um, so this talk, uh, I was rethinking this talk over the last weekend. I usually give a talk that's about an hour long, but you know, people, you gotta go places. So 20 minutes is what we're gonna try to go for in this talk for everyone. And for all of you out there in uh, virtual and everyone back home in Miami, I just wanna say thank you. Hi everyone, thank you to Carroll City, thank you to Liberty City, thank you to Overtown, thank you for you know, all my people who come from. So let us begin. So what I'd like to begin with is this idea, this concept that came to me a few years ago when I was sitting there at a symposium uh, for Hauser and Wirth. It was a, a symposium about the work of Philip Guston. And during that symposium, Art Spiegelman said something extremely profound, right, what I thought was profound. He might have thought it was a throwaway comment. But the comment was that caricature and comics are a pejorative language. And when he said that, he later went on to describe that the language of comics, the language of caricature, it actually uses signs and symbols, it uses elements that are actually, we know, they're commonplace, they're something that we use, they're something that we speak in all the time, but the, the masterfulness of a great caricaturist, of a good, great comic artist, is to actually merge these things and to kind of heighten and kind of allow us to see beyond, um, to bring out the things that we all commonly understand to be true about this reality and our shared reality, and then they are able to offer it back to us, emphasize it, make it powerful. Caricature is a, a, a friend of mine. It's something that I deeply have always loved. And, but for me, because my love of caricatures runs so deep, I see it in everything. So in the case of a work like this, I see caricature. Like if you know the story, you understand the terms of the story that this event, this painting, you know, Washington Crossing the Delaware, this version of the painting exists at the uh, Met Museum in New York City. This is just an interpretation of the event. This is not uh, a photographic accurate document. The, the ship isn't right. These boats are not the boats that they use for this event. The, the people on this boat, these are not the people. This is an imagination. This is, this is uh, Manuel Lutz taking character and using it to talk about this idea of democracy. It's something that was happening for him in Germany at this time, this very particular political moment. And he felt that 75 years after the events that he could actually like harness that visually by kind of creating this, this mythology in this painting. And that type of mythology, it can spread. So this painting traveled all throughout Germany. And well, this painting actually wasn't the one that actually ended up traveling around Germany. Like, because this is the painting that traveled around Germany. This is the actual original painting. The original painting was destroyed by us during World War II when we were bombing Berlin. This painting is a, another painting that he made a year after the original painting. And it was such a powerful image that it found itself in many different places. So if you look in the top corner over there, there's an actual like lithograph of the painting. These ideas, these principles of caricature, of image making, can travel. They're, they're very powerful. They're, and, and I think right now, at this moment right now, we don't really take into uh, deep consideration how many images we actually are seeing, how many things are actually hitting us, how many things are kind of instructing the way we see the world. And for me as an artist, this is something I use a little bit as a, as a Trojan horse, is to kind of like ride that wave, kind of touch on some of that, bring it up and then hand it back to you so that you can actually feel it, feel what I'm feeling, hopefully. So coming off of that energy, I end up moving to Philadelphia in 2018. And upon me moving to Philadelphia, an incredible curator by the name of Sid Sachs um, from the Rosenwald Wolf Gallery uh, a, a gallery that's no longer here because of the last week UART decided to close without telling people properly that they were losing their jobs, they were losing their education, they were losing their friends, they were losing their community. Sid Sachs came to me while I was moving in, literally moving into my house, and he said to me, Mark, would you want to have an opportunity to show for your first time in Philadelphia? And he offered that to me. So out of love and respect, I just for a moment, just think about you arts and how important they are to this city. Um, to lose another art institution is, is a tragedy. It's actually a tragedy. But the beautiful thing that Sid did is that when I came here, I said, I don't want to paint anymore. I'm just drawing. I'm just working like ink on paper. That's what I'm doing now. And Sid was like, great, go for it. And I was like, it's going to be kind of gruesome. It's going to be kind of heavy. And he's like, great, go for it. So 
with that love, I was able to kind of give you my own interpretation of Washington crossing the Delaware. In that original image, there's supposed to be different ethnic groups in America depicted throughout that image. And instead, I want to kind of depict a, a, almost like a boat, a family, or an individual, a, a herd of people that are being dragged together and being led forward by a madman in, <laughs> in his initiative to try to like take over. We have people vomiting. We have people, little demons playing on the back of the boat. We got death steering the ship at the end of the day. We have a black body being dragged under the waters. Another work from that show is the one about the one about uh, like Andrew Jackson. The sorry, the one about the theft of Florida by the criminal Andrew Jackson. Um, me being a Florida na native originally. I like to think about Florida and its formation as a place that when I was growing up, uh, I remember coming to New York City and people were kind of like, you're from Florida? Like, what's in Florida? You know, like, just Miami Beach, that's about it. And I was like, no, I mean, you know, this, this stuff. And, um, but now when you think about Florida, <laughs> it's a political juggernaut, right? It's, it's changing the way we think about everything. But if you go back to its beginnings, you go back to what Jackson did to actually take Florida um, then you might understand some of the history of that place, the history of us, the history of America, the history of westward expansion. It didn't just go west, it also went south. Some little details inside of these. So I've just basically started to settle into um, Philadelphia, and right around that time, uh, you know, I just got married and I, you know, was teaching and, and then um, COVID struck. So um, all of a sudden we're like locked up inside and, and I'm trying to figure out what to do. And my brain started turning back towards like Goya, started going back to Daumier. My brain started going back to the history of art that could actually speak truth to power. And so I started making images that were grim perhaps, but like, exacting or you know, like at that moment what I felt needed to be said rather than just what was light to be said. I felt there were things that were happening in this moment that we were going to forget. And this is something that I did not believe for myself in my own art form. From an early age, I always was very interested in bringing politics into my art. And as a young artist, I was told often, don't do that. People don't want that. People don't want to bring that into their lives. People don't want to see that. And what I've learned as an adult, people need it. It's not about what they want, it's about what they need. Because often when people see the work that I've made, later on, they'll, they forgot. They forgot about the moment. They forgot about what this moment was like. They forget about like, things that were said, things that were done, things that happened right in front of our faces, and that four years later, we're about to do it all again. Think about that. Think about every moment of those last four years and then four years previous. Think about that. And what are we doing to stop that? Sometimes you need to see a reminder just to start to stoke the flame to try to make some change in our lives. That's what I do. That's my work. Being from Florida and looking at that space, thinking about my father growing up in segregated Florida, I think about in his lifetime, he might see every change that occurred in his lifetime change once again and fall back. And you may think that that is impossible. You may think that that cannot happen, but we're watching it right in front of our eyes every day. Slowly, little levers of change moving, little votes, little changes here, voting right here, a little bill there, women can't do this, Queer people can't do this. And you think that's their group. You think that's not me, so I don't have to worry about it. But all of that, all of those laws are all tied together. And they know it. And the string is already being pulled. So do not just, just, just connect with that. Connect with it. Because we still have an ability to stop it. Still have a chance. So coming off that last work, my work previously had been these more like kind of one-to-one -one as politic, po like political moments were occurring, as events would occur. 
I would typically try to like rush out and try to make an image and try to draw something and try to like execute it. And it almost had this kind of like New Yorker like style where you'd have the like image and then you have a little bit of subtext there, similar to the piece I just showed you pre right, just right before this. But what occurred is that things were happening so fast, I needed a way to respond to it. And so that's when the town crier was born. That's when this character formed, uh, came to be. A voice that was a, uh, an individual that comes back from history who has the ability to just yell everything at you, tell you everything. It's in his body to just yell it. It's in his body just to like, explore it and to give it to everyone. So in a weird way, his body is the perfect like, machine, the perfect like, space in which I get to just yell things. And I think about that when you actually are reading that bold text and you're thinking about all the exclamation points, when you see the actual like, energy of the text, that like, maybe I'm actually translating that into people. Maybe they're actually being able to hear what I'm saying. Often what he's saying are not things that are like, you know, they're, they're just news headlines. Sometimes I do get in a little bit into my own self and I do say a little extra, but I try <laughs> just to report what I'm seeing. And a lot of the things that we think about, maybe we only remember one of these events, but many of these things all took place on the same day. Some of these things that you saw, that you read about, these things have not been resolved. Some of these things are three, four, or five years old, and you still are like, wait, we're still dealing with that? Like, that never got to happen? You know, like, that's, but it's building on us. It works on us. So that's, like, where the town crier was able to do for me, was able to give me the opportunity to almost kind of uh, compact a lot of the information that I was seeing, a lot of the things that I was feeling at the time. To get, tell you a little bit about my practice, so for me, my work starts in collage, typically starts with just the hand, me drawing. All the town criers that you saw previously, except for one, were all collages. So the actual like, language, the text, all of that is built with the figure, and the backgrounds are a whole other element that it's actually built separately. And then they're brought together, and then they're worked out, figured out how they actually like, kind of will interact, create the, what I hope is the maximum effect. I started using collage as a way because I felt like my compositions were getting stale, that some of the ideas that I had were stale. So how do I break apart? How do I start to think fragmentally? How do I think in a, in, a, in a way to think around some of the issues that are happening and not just be presented by them and let them just land on me and land and sit with inside of me? How do I actually turn that energy around and do something and try to build something? I'm trying to figure out how, this thing I've been working on for the last year is trying to figure out how to be constructive rather than deconstructive. How do I build something rather than just tear things down? How do I like, think about language that I can use that actually makes people want to exist as opposed to just simply like option for demise? That's what I've been thinking about. So collage happened to be the way to, for me to start thinking about that. So those forms change, and then they become larger paintings, which I execute. There's an Allen Iverson step over. Um, and, you know, Philadelphia being in this space, it is history. There's so many incredible things that are just literally just cemented into the ground <laughs> that are part of this country's history that we forget about. And they're happening all the time. So during this period of time, all my work that I was making was all black and white. I just stayed with inside of the realm of black and white for about, I don't know, four years. And then as things started to change, I started thinking about color and what does it mean to bring color back into the work? And what does it mean to actually bring that kind of energy back into the work? But for what I saw in that moment when I thought about what happened with the election and what was happening in the case of the insurrection and all these other events, like people are going to forget. So I wanted to have the work kind of speak to one another, one piece to the next. Started thinking about memento damnatio. I started thinking about this idea of erasure. And so inside the work itself, I started to allow for this erasure to occur. I would bring back the thing that you'd seen before, and then I was going to remove it. And then in its place, I would give you flowers. In its place, I would give you something that we can kind of be distracted by, something that we all can agree upon. The, the little hummingbird on the side that originally it said, you know, hope on its chest or was carrying like a banner of truth. And the later image is just this cute little bird. Thinking through other ways that I can actually attack um, abstraction and even taking the form even further away. 
playing with narratives, like you know, one about the, what is this, the, the crushed by his own wealth, the one about Spencer Trask. But then going back and then looking at that image again and then like reinterpreting it again. What is it to restate something? What is it to retell something? What is lost? What is gained when you actually go back and then reinvestigate an image, a concept? The boys, um, so this image, this is the original image, which was prior to that was a drawing that became this painting, which was from an experience of just actually being in North Philly and during COVID and just like one day, me and my wife were driving and I see like a raccoon in the middle of the day and like raccoon wasn't rabbit or anything, but it was around that time when like we had the garbage strike. So there was just piles of garbage everywhere. So the raccoon was just out there just doing what raccoons do. And you know, because that's what they would do normally. And so I see the raccoon, I'm thinking like, man, this is we're in some weird times. And then, and then all of a sudden these two kids on bikes like are popping a wheelie right through the intersection. And they have like these balloons on the back of their bike and it's at this beautiful, perfect arc, you know, just like this check mark kind of just shooting off in the back. And I'm looking at them and I'm like, man, in all of this darkness, in this crazy moment, these children are like living. They're figuring out how to live. And they even figured out how to get helium. Now, how do you get helium in the middle of COVID? I do not know. But these children are survivors. This is this moment where you kind of wake up to your own state and you think about what else one else is capable of doing in a moment. So I had to reinvestigate it. I had to relook at it. So this is the piece that was um, uh, in the MoCAD uh, exhibition, um, the Miami MoCAD exhibition. And so sometimes little details that were just there, plain sight, they get to be elevated. They get to be touched again. They get to be said again. And I get to look back at that painting and not think about it as a, a sad moment, but actually kind of think of it as a moment of life continuing. So the insurrection, that was another moment where I've made several drawings and several paintings about this moment and a moment that I felt like immediately, I was like, well, I guess this is gonna be a new battle cry for some people. And I know that this is gonna be the beginning of something for some people. And if we don't think about it as that, then we really are failing ourselves because we're watching it occur right in front of our faces. And uh, thinking about the term, the title of the piece is Boys Will Be Boys. The idea that these individuals could come inside of the actual like, you know, Capitol building, that they could actually bring a, a Confederate flag into that space, that they could defecate inside of that space. They could break things, steal things inside that space. No cop stops them. Nobody gets arrested around the spot. It's just allowed to occur. Boys will be boys. And then the same bodies, the always the same bodies, the poor bodies, the bodies who are laboring bodies are the bodies that have to come up and clean up afterwards. And everything is put back together and it goes all the same because it's just boys will be boys. That tells people something, that informs people something, that there is a line that if you cross it, it is okay. So please come back in four years. That's what's up. That's what it means to make work about that versus making work about any other given subject that I could work in or play within. But then reattaching it coming back, looking at it, thinking about them, watching, making that painting after, right after it occurred, when people were like, you're never gonna forget this, people aren't gonna forget this, I'm like, oh wait. And then saying, okay, I see the forgetting, I wanna attack it, I wanna touch it, I wanna, I wanna bring it back into the room again. A piece like Rally Jams, thinking about music, phrases, there's a thing here I've noticed uh, between New York and New Jersey, Jersey Jams, just like certain songs that are always on the radio, like time stopped in 1989 for some reason. And it's just like, man, like the boss, I mean, I ain't gonna say anything bad about the boss because I wanna live tonight. But like, you know, you, you, there's these songs, there's these rhythms, there's these things, and these are the same songs and rhythms that you, when you go to a Trump rally, this is the same songs you see, same things that you hear right before he comes up on stage and says something about like, you know, we need to get rid of these people, these people are monsters, these people are mongrels, these things, before all that stuff. You were sitting there with your friends and you're like, yeah, I remember the beach, man, that was great. You know, I remember, you know, the idea of normalizing, normalizing a behavior, normalizing, making it feel like we're all here together. We're just a bunch of people having a, a, a night out. That's it. That's it. You know, let's just a night out. Let's, let's then spew some hate, go home, have some popcorn, go to sleep, and then, um, you know, go to our jobs, I guess. So... Another thing I'm kind of playing with lately is this idea of um, 
you know, still life and re-looking at still life and how do we break apart still life and a still life that isn't just a still life, a still life that's actually a fight, a still life that's like, you know, you don't get to just like look at the flowers and just call it a day. Like things are, things are happening. Last thing I'll, I'll end up talking about is a project. Um, it's called Everyone Should Have One on Their Wall. So back in 2021, there was a lot of desire to have people of the African diaspora speak to the events of uh, the, like the previous president, to the uprising of 2020. And in that moment, I saw this beautiful little opening where I was like, oh, you really want to hear what I have to say? OK. So in that moment, when we're having the conversation about looking at black death, when you're talking about the idea of seeing violence against black bodies and who's showing these images, who's profiting off of these images. And so I started thinking to myself, I've never seen a dead Klansman. I don't know if anyone here has seen a dead Klansman. Has anyone ever seen a lynch, dead, a lynch Klansman? Has anyone ever seen someone drag a, a Klansman down the street? Has anyone ever had the experience of seeing the fear of Klansmen? I live in a body where I'm told to be in fear of these people, where I am in fear of these people, but yet they are somehow afraid of me, but I've never seen their death, I've never seen their demise. That's, that's something. If you don't think that's a strange blind spot of power inside of this country, if you don't see that, then you're missing the game. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna make it as a print. I'm going to make it as a, a silk screen, OK? So everyone should have one on their wall. If everyone wants to show their solidarity, everyone wants to show that they care so much, then here, I'll make it as a silk screen. Well, I don't buy silk screens. I'm like, OK, fine. I'll make it as a litho lithograph. Fine. You want it as a lithograph? You don't want it as a lithograph. OK, fine. I'll make, it as a, I'll make it as a free poster. Here, it's a free poster. You can just take it, and you can have it in your life. No, no charge whatsoever, you know, because it's important, right? And so then I realized that maybe I need to explain it to people what these things actually mean. So in a series of etchings, I made this first one we call the prize, the second one called the savior, third one is called the discussion, fourth one is called the fall, the improvement, the monument, the spread, and then the hope. So I was then asked to do an exhibition at AMP here in Philadelphia, where I decided to see, well, I've made it as a drawing, I've made it as a print, I've made it as a painting, I've made large scale paintings, I've made it small scale paintings. So let's maybe make it as a sculpture. So I'm now gonna show you, if you've never saw the piece while it was here in Philadelphia, I'm just gonna show you a video of the work. Thank you. 
we sometimes fear what comes next. And, and not until I actually made that piece and I actually made that flower move that I actually started to think about what comes next. We like to think that we are always evolving, our society is always advancing, and now we're starting to think maybe it's not. So what are we willing to give up? What are, what are we willing to see die? What are we willing to let go of so that we can actually move forward? What parts of ourselves, what parts of our power that we are willing to give up so we can actually all move forward? It's necessity. So I'm gonna leave you with this. So every piece that I do, um, I typically have a poster that goes along with it, uh, a show, I usually have a poster. So for this one, I wrote this work. Their failure is our reward. Hear ye, hear ye. Governor Ron DeSantis bans an AP Af African American Studies in Florida high schools in 2023. Next, he is awarded a gold medal by the Union League of Philadelphia. That is the there I speak of. It is in all our best interests that we invest ourselves in the failure of those Americans who seek to divide and conquer us, those who wish to shuttle us into the shadows of history. I was asked to consider a question. Is the sun setting on our democracy? I cannot foretell the future. I am just a town crier digging a grave for a construct of white supremacy. In the end, all I can do is plant seeds, waiting for a new day to rise. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, uh, for that moving presentation. And thank you for our um, in-person and our virtual audience that uh, joined. Um, you can't help but to sit at the foot of an artist like Mark and be moved um, to be moved by the state of the world, of the current political climate. Um, I see the necessity of art in your voice uh, for times such as this. And you know, uh, when we go to sit down in conversations like this, we chart our questions out in advance and then a wrecking ball like Mark comes in <laughs> and, <laughs> and throws your thoughts into, um, into a space. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> no, I think you know that art as agitation is certainly, um, certainly a space that you are occupying and that we need you to occupy within institutions like ours. So thank you to our partners at Miami MOCAD and to the colleagues at Barnes that convened and invite us both into this space. Um, I was originally gonna ask you about virtual spaces, but perhaps we sh should start in a different place. I am moved by the original painting you showed us of, um, of, um, uh, uh, of that colonial passage across the, across the waters mm -hmm. and the position it held in the portrait of, uh, I believe it was Lincoln, if I'm yeah. correct. Yeah, but um, I'm thinking about the ways that those mythologies uh, support each other. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also thinking about, uh, since we are talking about virtual space, the proliferation of ideas. And I'm wondering a bit, uh, you are in, in many ways perhaps using your own work in similar ways to um, to have undo um, this idea that that you know history is written by the victors and perhaps there's an opportunity mm. to revisit and to mm. rewrite history mm. and to do so by retelling stories and by building sort of new narratives that are true to the experiences of those uh, who come from folks who have bodies like ours, brown, mm -hmm. from southern places. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, I'm wondering about sort of this repetition and this retelling as, as necessity and as a, as a space that could perhaps create new avenues for communication or the building of power agency. That's a question. No, um, <laughs> no, but it's a good question because it makes me think I have two, I have two ways of thinking about it. One is in the virtual, one is in the physical. In the case of the virtual, I think about the idea of seating. I think the idea that, you know, to pro propose a space, not needing the brick and mortar, not needing the, the structures that we've always been kind of like kept out of, but then to be able to define a space for yourself and to be able to clearly design it and maybe even invoke spaces that don't exist inside of that to rethink about what kind of bodies have access at that period of time, you know, in that moment when dealing with the virtual space. It's not just able bodies, it can be all forms of bodies can enter into that space. And then it'll maybe even start to interact and hold material in a different way, have access at a different level. So I do think about that 
as a positive in that virtual space. In the physical space, when we're talking about the idea of like planting the seed for something that a rewriting history. I think about Confederate memorials. I think about objects and spaces that venerate individuals who are actually traitors to our country. I think about that being on display. I think about my second grade history, history teacher talking about the War of Northern Aggression in 1980 something. Mm -hmm. You know, I think about ways in which language and ways in which systems can actually sit there and as there are other bodies also participating in that conversation, it stacks upon itself and that's how you form a reality. Mm -hmm. You can form a reality like that. There are moments and things that can occur that can help snap that and break that. I think satire is one of those things. I think that undermining is a one of those things. I think about Trojan horses. I think about ways in which something shows you a front one way, but actually is doing other work. I think about that. Two different speeds happening at the same time. And I guess in that case, I wonder uh, the ways that you are. Now I'm just going completely off script, Martha. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering about. You know the what's going to happen. <laughs> had to happen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I wonder about the ways you are using humor and beauty also as the Trojan horses within your work. Yeah, I think because I think I come from a place. I won't tell any stories, but I will say I come from a place where sometimes dark stories are told, but they're told in a way it's funny. Mm -hmm. And that you are all sitting around and you're hearing something that if an outsider were to hear it, they'd be like, oh my God, like, wait, what happened to who, that person? Like, your uncle did what? And then, but at the time when you're all sitting there, you're laughing about it because the absurdity of it, the strangeness of it, the, 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 the fact that it occurred, the fact that it elevated and the fact that it continued, you know, like these are the stretch, the stretch, the duration of it, the telling of it, mm -hmm. the language that's used to display it. Mm -hmm. So then that's where the beauty comes in. That's when the line comes in. That's when like the language comes in. This idea of these multiple facets that need to kind of come together. And if you hit the rhythm right, you hit something, mm -hmm. you move further down. It's, it's part of the storytelling aspect, you know? Yeah. And I guess I would then ask, um, of all the places we can have these conversations that center on the urgency of now, this current political climate, um, what, in your, through your lens, what is sort of the distinct role of both the artist and, and maybe the art as a part of that, mm. and, and the institution? Why, why are museums an important sort of space for this conversation to be had? Mm -hmm. Well, there's also two answers to that. I think when I was younger, I felt that why is not why aren't why isn't everybody making work like this? Like why isn't everyone trying to put their voices into this? Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's moments that occur that are such hard ruptures that voices that typically do that are not comfortable speaking up or not accustomed to speaking up will speak up. But usually that space recedes. And then there are voices who are constantly just kind of built that way, kind of, you know, always a little bit more sensitive to the, that vibration that are always constantly at that level and always willing to engage at that level. So when it comes to artists, I tried, I've learned to not be so um, prescriptive about what everyone else should be doing and really just try to take care of my side of the street mm -hmm. and try to think about what I'm doing because that work is enough, you know, or like it's an, it keeps me occupied enough. Mm -hmm. um, the role of institutions, it varies because not every institution has the same charter, right? Not every institution has the same framework, the same individuals, the same people invested inside of that space to even have the conversations. Mm -hmm. So often what happens is that spaces will try to band-aid themselves into a, a solution mm -hmm. rather than really thinking about the concrete structural things that need to actually occur so that they can actually take the storms, that they can change, they, they have to bend, they have to be able to work with it. It's not um, the temporal aspect of the conflicts that we deal with are not just in the immediate. Mm -hmm. They, are, they exist in the past, they are hitting us in the present, and they will continue into the future. Mm -hmm. But if you just are making a Band-Aid because of something that happened prior to that, that can easily be ripped off by any storm. Mm -hmm. So you need to figure out how do you actually make, I mean, thinking about Miami stuff, how do you make a cinder block house that can really withstand <laughs> a, a category four? You know, Northerners don't know about that. Yeah. But like, this is like the way you think about like, space, where you think about these institutions. And sometimes we ask certain institutions to do certain work that they are not actually built to do. Hmm. And we can really hit ourselves hard, our head hard on that wall until we take the moment to think about what was this institution actually built to do? Hmm. Was it just built to display the wealth of certain people? 
Was it there to actually to explore and to make things more open for individuals? Was it there to highlight voices that have never been heard before? Mm -hmm. That's the thing. That's, that's a part of it. You know, that's what I think about. It's, giving me, it's helping me have a little bit more grace with people about certain things. Because everyone, everyone's in my head, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I guess um, we'll soon open the floor. Thank you for those answers, Mark. We'll soon open the floor for questions uh, in the uh, in-person audience and in the virtual for our virtual audience as well. Uh, so uh, if you have questions in the virtual space, I do encourage you to drop them in the chat, and we certainly will bring them uh, into the floor, into the conversation. And then soon, one of my colleagues will uh, will pass the microphone around to take questions from our in-person audience. Um, if I was to perhaps ask you. Uh, um, a final question. Uh, maybe we can turn towards your practice okay. um, and and think about um, the space of the town crier um, and the the and if the urgency of the message being communicated is represented and and, and perhaps I'm incorrect in this assumption mm -hmm. is represented in the physical proximity it sort of mm -hmm. takes up within the work. Yeah. Um, there are times the text uh, mm -hmm. is is sort of occupying a smaller space within your work. And then there's times mm -hmm. that the message um, it leaps off the work into the sort yeah. of mind and the and the the field and the gaze of the viewer. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how you oscillate between those two worlds and how you and how a message sort of implores you or guides you to give it more space within your within the work you're working on. Yeah, it's it, I would say it's um. Uh, this is going to get a little weird. Okay. It's a little bit like. <laughs> Sometimes like conjuring. Yeah, sure. It's like I can't like. Sometimes the information is such that the relationship to the figure inside of it is taking over the world. You know, I think for me when I read, I use a news aggregator, and thank God for it because I used to just have to search through everything and look at everything and then try to like take information and try to put it together. That's just the way my brain works. Um, so I'm, I want to understand where I'm at. I want to triangulate. And so for that character, like that, sometimes that stuff does take up something more. It does sometimes go out there. Like there's a certain level, I'm dyslexic. So like mm -hmm. me writing it like that, me turning my thoughts into language like that was something that I had feared my entire life. Mm -hmm. And then there was just a moment where it was just like, I have to do this. Yeah. But if I do it like a drawing, like I don't really see the, 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 the text. I see it as drawing. Mm -hmm. It's like it's scrying, it's like symbols. It's just like, it's, it's just hitting and it's like, they just make sense. And so then I'm able to just to run with it and I'm just able to do it and then I'm able to make it and then I'm able to see it and then I kind of like get there. It's like when I do it, I try to do it, I do it in one sitting. It doesn't just happen like over a day and I'll come back and I'll, oh, maybe I'll add this to it. It's like, no, it's just like, boom, mm. and it's out. And then I, and I deal with it and then I'm like, okay. Um, so I think that the tension that you see is this idea of me trying to understand and reconcile. Mm -hmm. Sometimes just even the information that I'm getting, mm -hmm. or there was one where um, uh, like some days you have a news event and three things will happen about that one event as I'm actually dr doing the drawing. Mm -hmm. So then I'm like, okay, so like this happened now, this here, and I want that to be in the drawing. I want that kind of energy. I want that type of speed that we're actually getting hit with by information to be present in the work. Yeah. I think Philadelphia is moving quickly towards this sort of um, celebration of the semi sesquicentennial, and yeah. I always, um, I always pat myself on the back when I say that correctly. I know. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> so thinking <Your> about <laughs> thinking about 1776 and Philadelphia, um, and I'm just in this moment grateful to have a gaze and a practice like yours in conversation and in community uh, here in Philadelphia as we approach that moment. Um, I can't help but see within your work this the way that you are um, bridging time with sort of the urgency of the mm. current political climate. And so maybe my last question to you, and I, I think of the town crier, but certainly this is happening across your body of work is, um, 
the sort of colonial reckonings of of that sort of exists within the when we consider the foundations of the yeah. United States. Um, you're you're calling on that image um, and those histories, but you're also leaping f forward to this moment of now. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how you are thinking about bridging time and telling a complete story about this um, great American experiment. And perhaps that's my last question to you before we turn to towards the, our audience? I mean, living in Philadelphia, you get to touch history all the time. Sometimes it's been masquerades, you know, sometimes it's like hidden or sometimes it's like, you know, up against a glass structure, you know, but it's, it's there. And there's the people, the people of this community, the people of North Philadelphia, um, the people of all of the different areas, towns, many streets and all that stuff of Philadelphia that know their history, understand where they kind of come from inside this space. They hold that. I think about when I'm looking at an image or an events occurring, for me, I mean, I was always an interest, a very interested in American history. And so for me, it's more like I feel, or if I'm walking through the American Wing of a Museum or all these other things, I'm looking and I'm thinking about the images. Sometimes I see an image and then I'm like, oh wait, that's a part of this, like this event that occurred. You know, this is when Jefferson did X or this is when this person did Y. And so then I'm, so I have this kind of Rolodex in my brain and I sometimes try to figure out, like, okay, what is the, the event that has occurred that maybe was the, the, the first brick in forming this thing that's now a tower in our world, the way that we see this society, the way that we conceive this, this, this America. But then also I'm starting to come to terms with the fact that I'm an East, I'm an East Coaster. And so I've been, you know, Miami and New York and da, 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 da. But like the Midwest, I'm still trying to learn about that. And it's crazy. It's a completely other animal. There's a lot of stuff there to learn, you know. And, you know, and it's like, and it's like that. And then I'm so I am also suffering from the condition of being an American, of being a regional American, of having a certain perspective on American history and the individuals that live around me and why I think I should be able to do this and why you should, you know, why we all do what we do. So the work gets to be this container that holds that at any given time. That's what I love about making work. That's why I'm obsessed with making work. That's why I'm always constantly in there making something because, because I have so many questions and I get to actually explore them. Like when I made my books, I only way I had certain questions and the only way I could do it is in this long durational format was to draw all these images because I couldn't see it. And then as I'm making the book, I start to go like, oh, that's what this is all about. Or like, this is how I actually feel about utopia. Or this is how I actually feel about American history and like, and, and, and tragedy and, 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 and blood trauma. This is how I feel about that. Mm -hmm. Like the books help me or the work also helps me kind of see how I feel. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think we'll turn towards our, um, our audience. I see we have a question in the back. Yeah, um, I just want to, Thank you both for the conversation. Thank you, Mark, for your work. You. Um, I think that I speak for all of us when I say that we're glad that you ignored whoever told you not to bring politics into it. <laughs> Thank uh, you. I think that was a good move. Um, we do have some questions online, so I'm going to let um, Aaliyah read sure. two of them. Thank you. So there are a few that have to do uh, with your process. And so maybe I'll ask them kind of together. Sure. Um, so uh, Caroline asks, how do you decide something needs to be said through a drawing versus a book or any other medium of yours? Uh -huh. um, Nina says, I'm fascinated by your use of text and especially the power of your titles. Do you ever start with a title, especially mm. in your serial work or is it the visual image prior? And I do have others, but I can turn right. it over to the in-house. So, so in some weird, weird way, I think over the time, working through the different mediums that I've been working through, I work in print, I work in books, I work in um, painting and drawing and, you know, and sculpture now a little bit. But I find that it's almost about duration, like what things need to be said, what, what things I want to communicate to you that take, are going to take a little bit more time that I, I'm not just going to say them at you, but I want you to kind of walk with me a little bit and talk with me a little bit and then get to the place to where when I start to start getting into the mix with it with you, you can trust the fact that I'm not just coming out of the blue at you. But I'm like, no, you can tell that I'm thinking about this. So 
Now that if you see it at this perception and you see it at this place, then, then maybe wouldn't this possibly be an answer for this issue? That's how I think about it when I think about the books. When the, the daily practice or the, when I get to do a town crier, that comes out of, came out of a necessity. So all of the different practices have their own necessity, have their own method, um, their own way of dealing with collapse and time is how I think about it. I think about my work in compression and time. That's like what I'm always thinking about. And I almost feel like the weaker images is when I've not been able to take enough time and been able to compress it into the image. Um, the second question was about titles. So uh, sometimes I'll be work, I'll working on something and I'm drawing something. And then if I really get loose and my brain really starts to have fun, I'll, all of a sudden a title will pop up in my head. And so it might not even be for this work, but I'll just write it into the drawing because I know it's just too good. Like the language is too hot. So then I have to take it and I have to try to remember it and bring it to something, you know. And that's how it works. And sometimes you make a whole piece and it's about to leave the, 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 the studio and you're like, I have no idea what that's called. I don't know, Untitled number 21, you know? And then you're like, you're like, okay, no, I gotta try to, I gotta, I gotta do this for posterity. So then, you know, but then I try to sit down and I really try to think and then sometimes I'll have to open up some books or sometimes I have to put some music on or I have to do certain things to kind of like take me back to the moment of when the work was being made. Think about the original intent for the work. What is it that I wanted to say? That's kind of the bar that I kind of try to hold up for myself. And then, um, and then usually it comes, you know, then it usually comes out of me. I had this piece called Keeping Quiet that I just recently made, which are these tulips. And I, I was thinking about with, in certain political stages that are happening in our world right now, there's this element of where you don't know what to say. You don't know how to interact. And so I was sitting there with it and I was looking at this painting and I was like, just keeping quiet. Like, this is what this is. And that can mean a lot of different things, you know, keeping quiet because you need to consider what's actually being said, keeping quiet because, you know, if you do say something that the retribution is too great, there, but it's, but it's the silence that the image held for me that made me think about that, that brought me to that. So do we have a question? I think we have a question here, Martha. Yes. Hello. Oh, do I need a microphone? Yeah, you got to check the mic. need a microphone? Yeah. And do I hold it like this? Yes, you can hold it like this. <laughs> okay. This is cute. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I'm thinking about the work in institutions and the work being institutions and what the work is saying and how, how it's transmitted and where it goes within institutions and how far it goes. Have you ever thought about making a town crier a performance piece outside of the institution and into the community where there's actually a real town crier in North Philly bringing up these problems, a real town crier in South Philly. I own two bells. Huh? I own some bells. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, like it's, and I got the hat, but there's, there's, not you. No, no, but I, but I, but you know, know short but, guy. But, but to, 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 your, but to answer your question, nah, I can't get into that little outfit, man. I'm nah, gonna, you I look silly. <laughs> it's just not working. Um, maybe 20, 20 years ago. But like the, um, I, I am, I am, I am beginning to think about ways in which these, these things can manifest themselves in a physical form beyond that. Mm -hmm. Um, I had, I had an idea for an exhibition where they would be read by someone, you know, and I think, and I bought the bell because I wanted to see how disturbing it was <laughs> and like, and it's pretty disturbing, man. It's like loud, especially inside of a closed room. And that's why I like, you know, um, so yeah, I have been thinking about that. I have to, I have to, it's. Yes, number 17 on the plan. <laughs> we, have, we have 16 plans going right now, people. So like, maybe that's number 17. Thank you, the great Danny Simmons, for the 17th plan. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Danny. Do we have another question in person? or? Yes, you have a question back there? Okay. We'll all take right. Another I question. Run all the way over there? No. No, <laughs> just say it. We're in the room. We're all family here. It's Philly. Come on. <laughs> Our virtual audience will want to hear, though. All right. I can repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> we can repeat it. Question here, too. Uh, why don't we do the online one and then the one in the middle? Okay. Uh, so, Elisa asks You mentioned Goya. Are there works by Goya you have, been, have thought of reinventing, so to speak, to address the current divisive political climate? 
I, I think of him as an inspiration. When I think about his images of war, I think about him when he paints royals, and he's obviously a little bit of mockery at play in those images. I think about the slyness of him. Um, I take certain artists and I try to, they, I maybe like line work. I might be doing a little Goya, you know, I might be stepping into a little auto dicks. I might be stepping into like certain people because I know there's a rhythm to it. There's a reason why those lines exist because there's a language to it. But as far as like just directly like um, mining or aping and taking the donkeys and taking like certain creatures and bats and like those things to me, they exist and they give me the liberty to go forward. So if I do reference it, I would have to counterpoint it with the next iteration, the next like phrase. You know, it wouldn't just be in um, complete concord with that. It would have to be, you know, coming off what Goya said, you know, it has to feel a little bit more uh, forward if I were to do that. Question? I think we have a question in the middle. Right. Yes. Uh... Thank you for being here, first and Thank you for being foremost. here. Uh, I remember first seeing some monsters loom large and being reminded that they're still out there and they're scary as hell. Mm -hmm. I was on my way in today and got a note on my phone that the Kansas Supreme Court had just ruled that voting was not a fundamental right. Mm -hmm. And I see where this nation is going, but let me stop being heavy. Uh, no, let's go light. No, because you brought, <laughs> no. When you brought up the uh, <laughs> Jersey Shore music and Trump rallies, it just dawned on me. Have you thought about incorporating music in any of your productions? Well, the music for the, the flower piece was um, composed by me and um, two musicians. So it was like, well, the first piece is actually taken from uh, an, a piece of music called The Sword of Robert E. Lee, which was actually more of a, a battle, not a battle, but something you hear parade music, something that's kind of like upbeat, and then we slowed it down, we turned it into a dirge, we, we, we messed with it, you know, we, we, we took it back. The um, second piece was something that we just kind of came up with on the fly and kind of, you know, I gave some production idea, ideas and then the musicians performed it. I do think about music as an element, but it's like I'm working on a new piece um, for um, uh, Berman College, uh, for Berman Museum, I'm sorry, at Ursinus College. And that will have music that I'm working with a musician on that will have like this larger animated element to it that I'm hand drawing, which is killing me and killing people who are helping me do it. Um, that's hand drawn animation. How hard could it be? You know, like <laughs> 3000 drawings is just two minutes. Um, that's crazy. So, um, so I am thinking about all these different ways of sound, media, all these different forms. I mean, I, I just feel like all of it for me really always stems back into drawing. And then if the, as I'm drawing, sometimes as I'm drawing, I start to hear a music, I start to hear a sound, I start to realize that it needs to move and become something else. So drawing is like a scaffold. Some people think of drawing as just a scaffolding. To me, it's everything. I never stop seeing the drawing, even when I fully executed it. That's why the whole flower, the line, bending that line, twisting that line, that's what it's about for me. That's what I'm doing. I'm bringing the line to life. So if I think about music, it has to have that kind of entanglement to it. And that's why I think cello, for some reason, seems to do it for me. But, you know, I think about that. And thank you for that, that news. I mean, thank you for saying that, because not everyone tones into the news. Not everyone knows that, that something like that's going down, that someone's saying that voting is not a fundamental right. Like, how can you even stand up in front of anybody in this country and say that voting is not a fundamental right mm -hmm. and that we don't just run them out of town? <laughs> Seriously, that we just don't like throw them on like, you know, and get it like, no, OK, you're right. Bye. You know, no one had to vote for that. We can just get you out. But, um, you know, it's, that's how that's how quickly this is happening. But it's also because there's been long, consistent effort for the last 40 years or so to build this structure. It didn't happen overnight. These rails took time to build. So it will take time to dismantle them as well. I think we have one more question in the auditorium. Yeah. Yes. Uh, mine is not very political. It's more of an inside baseball question. But All right. of that sculpture, I'm just really interested in the materials you use, especially in the movement for that flower. It was really unique how the head seemed to move mm -hmm. uh, individually from the body and then resync. I'm just interested in that. 
So um, I worked with an amazing uh, animatronic artist who actually, if you ever saw Aliens, the first, like Aliens, the second Alien movie, he actually developed the face huggers for that. He also, um, if you've ever seen Spaceballs, the character Pizza the Hut, he did, he made Pizza the Hut. I was I was at his studio. I was like, I'm in the, I'm in the house of greatness, you know. Like he was like, take a knee, and um, and I had some idea on how to actually build the form because I was looking at if you don't know if you're not the right age, the Takara dancing flower. It was a, a toy from the 1980s. It was like you put on music and then the little flower would dance, All right? Yeah. So. I used, I, I, we, we took that apart and we deconstructed, reverse engineered that form, but then we also worked on how do we build servos that connect to the head. So we had servos and it connected inside of the head in a wiring system. And so inside of the actual mound itself is actually the machinery of it. And that is connected to whole other system, a computer system that's running the lights that are going on up, up top and running everything. So we unify everything. Thing and what I love to do is that I have everyone work on one individual thing separately. I just give them time codes. I'm like, it goes here at four or four ten. It goes there at three eighteen. I draw it out on my on a piece of paper and I handed this guy what I wanted it to do. I see it does that, and then I take it. The music you're doing that, then I take it. The person with the lights, okay, the lights do this. They like to do that. You know. We might have to do some things in person. I ain't gonna be, you know, Tom Weaver's a you know, tough guy. I ain't gonna mess with him. He did a lot. And so, I, but then at that moment, when we actually brought it all together for the first time, after a year of working on this thing, it was incredible. Because for the first time, someone hit play, and then it did it. And then when it started to move, People were like, what the hell? And I'm like, this is what's been in my head for a year. <laughs> like, this, like, this is what I've been holding on to for a year. And then they're like, oh my God, okay. And um, I think that's how I almost like to work with things. Even when I work with students as a teacher, I try to plant little seeds in there and then I wait for them to sprout. Maybe they sprout by the end of the semester, please. And if they don't, then I have to be in a you know grocery store, you know, like four years later, like that thing you said to me. And I'm like, hey, it made fruit. There we go. Well, I think we have come to the close of our program. Please join me in thanking Mark Thomas Gibson for his work, for his contributions. Thank you. Again, we thank our colleagues uh, at Miami MOCAD for their collaboration and partnership. We thank our virtual audiences in Philadelphia, beyond, but certainly in Miami. Uh, enjoy your after party. Um, Can you say one thing? Yeah, of course. I also want to say happy birthday to my sister, Pamela. <laughs> I did it, Pammy. All right. Uh, <laughs> happy birthday, Pamela. Uh, and enjoy your evening. Uh, please uh, visit barnesfoundation.org so you can learn about all the great things happening here. Uh, if you enjoy this lecture, you certainly will enjoy an educational moment led by Martha Lucy and her team. Um, and we do hope to see you soon. Enjoy your night and thank you. Thank you.